We've got an interesting one today, one of the quintessential revolvers of all time. Developed back in the 1800s, it deviated from the old top brake design with one of the first pistols to come out with a, a side swing out cylinder. Smith & Wesson Model 10. Hi, I'm Jim Humphrey with Eminent Threat Defense Firearms Training. And today I'm going to take you through the inner workings of this Model 10. First developed in 1899 as the Model 1899, it was later marketed as a 38 military and police special. In about 1957, they changed it to the Model 10. This particular one is a Model 10-6, built in the 70s, saw service as a, a, a police sidearm. So, we've done our safety check. This pistol's empty. Let's get started. This assembly of these older pistols always starts with a liberal application of a penetrating well like coil. In order to minimize damage to the screws, use the correct size screwdriver and give the penetrating oil time to work. The stocks on the Model 10 are held on with a single screw. Remove the stocks by pulling straight away from the frame as there is an aligning hole and a stud. There are three side plate screws. There's one flat headed screw and two crown headed screws. The front crown headed screw retains the yoke and the cylinder. This is a special screw. Keep it separate. With the front screw removed, the yoke and the cylinder will slide out. We'll set those aside for later. The other two screws can now be removed. Note that the front crown screw is actually the same part number as the middle crown screw, and they look identical. However, the front crown screw has been factory fitted to properly retain the yoke, and it takes a micrometer to see the difference. Make a note of the two links and keep the screws separate. To remove the side plate, Use a brass or plastic hammer to tap the frame a few times. This should loosen the side plate. Lift up the side plate from the bottom edge as there is a retention notch in the top arm. This is all the further you need to take the disassembly of the frame to do regular cleaning. Here you can see the internal parts. The trigger, the hand, the rebound slide, the hammer block, the hammer, the mainspring, and the cylinder stop. The hammer block just rests on top of the other parts, so if it hasn't fallen out already, just remove it and set it aside. We need to disengage the hammer from the mainspring. The mainspring is retained by the strain screw. Note that this screw is a little larger than the other screws, so will require a larger driver. Loosen the screw and the mainspring will fall free. The easiest way to remove and install the rebound slide is with a special tool. I fabricated this one out of a piece of 3 16 inch brass rod stock, but you can find them online. Use caution, the rebound slide spring is very powerful and easy to launch across the room. Keep it covered until it releases. To remove the hammer, push back on the bolt and pull back on the trigger. Note when the hammer is cocked, it will hold back the bolt. Now lift the hammer straight up. We'll leave the stirrup, sear, and firing pin attached to the hammer. To remove the trigger, pull back the hand and lift straight up on the trigger. Set it aside, we'll come back to it later. To remove the cylinder stop, rotate it down clear of the frame, then lift straight up on it. I use a non-marring nylon tool for work like this. Note that the spring will cause the stop to twist and bind, but work it up slowly keeping the spring covered until it releases. The spring comes out easily, so be careful to retain it. The last piece in the frame is the bolt, which is retained by the thumb piece nut on the left side of the pistol. Remove the nut and the thumb piece, again using the correct size driver for the nut. The nut will fall free from the thumb piece. The bolt is held in place by the spring-loaded bolt plunger. To remove the bolt, push it to the rear, compressing the plunger, and lift up on the front of the bolt. Be careful to release the pressure on the plunger before lifting the bolt out. Note, the plunger and spring are very small parts. The extracting rod locking bolt is retained by a very tight-fitting pin, so for this project we'll leave it alone as there is some potential for scratching the finish. 
Let's have a look at the trigger group. The trigger lever and the hand can be removed. The trigger lever is attached with a very tight pin, but the hand is retained by a spring and can be simply lifted off. The spring is inside the trigger and is retained by a pin. That completes the disassembly of the frame. Now we can have a look at the yoke and cylinder. The yoke should slide easily off the extractor rod. In order to disassemble the rest of the cylinder, we have to unthread the extractor rod. This can be a little tricky. Some extractor rods are left-hand thread and some are right-hand thread. It obviously pays to do your homework. The extractor rod on this H. Smith & Wesson is attached with a left-hand thread. You need to protect the rod with a piece of leather or use padded pliers to remove it. In this case, the rod is too tight for my pliers, so I will use a special clamp. If the rod is very tight, it's a good idea to put a couple of dummy rounds in the cylinder to support the extractor. This tool is homemade. It is aluminum so it won't scratch the rod, but similar tools can be found at Brown Mills or Midway USA. The extractor rod is spring-loaded. It is a very light spring, but keep a little pressure on it as it unscrews. With the extractor rod removed, the remainder of the pieces can be just pulled apart. The extractor rod collar will probably come off with the rod, so notice its orientation. The center pin has a small spring. The large extractor spring is fairly thin, so remove it carefully. Now the extractor can be removed from the other end of the cylinder. Note that in earlier models, there may also be a separate gas ring that fits into the cylinder to seal the yoke. The separate gas ring may not fall out easily, but should be removed for cleaning. So note the orientation for reassembly. On this model, the gas ring is integral to the yoke and is not a separate piece. The assembly of the cylinder is the reverse process. Note that the extractor stem is grooved. This groove must be aligned with a notch in the cylinder. Align the groove with the notch and slide the extractor into the cylinder. Now from the other end of the cylinder, insert the extractor spring and the center pin. Place the extractor rod collar on the extractor rod so the collar will fit inside the extractor spring. Thread on the extractor rod. Remember, this is a left-handed thread. Using the padded pliers or the extractor rod tool, firmly tighten the extractor rod. Insert the yoke and add a few drops of oil to the yoke and extractor rod. We'll set the yoke and cylinder aside while we assemble the frame. Next, we will assemble the frame. First, be sure you have all the parts. In particular, the small bolt plunger spring and the cylinder stop spring. Start the frame assembly with the bolt. Insert the plunger into the bolt into the slot and push back on the bolt so that you can press the plunger and then drop the bolt into place. Attach the thumb piece, secure it to the bolt with the thumb piece nut. Next, insert the cylinder stop. This piece must be dropped straight down on the stud while compressing the spring. This can be tricky, so take care not to launch the spring across the room. This is one of those springs you can only drop once because you'll likely never find it to drop it again. Before installing the trigger, the hand must be attached to the trigger. The hand is held to the trigger by a spring inside the trigger. The hand has two pins in the back. The longer pin is the hinge pin and the short pin is the spring retainer. The spring must be pushed back far enough to get the short pin behind the spring. When the hand is properly installed, the spring will hold it in position. To install the trigger, push the trigger lever up so it stays inside the frame. Pull the hand back and line the trigger up with the cylinder stop and drop the trigger straight down on the trigger stud. Once the trigger is in place, give the hand a nudge so that it fits into the hand slot. 
trigger lever must be accessible to the hole in the end of the rebound slot. To install the hammer, the bolt must be held back. This is easier done by temporarily installing the cylinder. The cylinder will hold back the bolt. Lift up on the stirrup so it stays above the rebound slide stud. During install, the firing pin will barely clear the frame. Now, pull the trigger back, then drop the hammer straight down on the hammer stud. The rebound slide is installed by placing the front of the slide against the trigger lever. So the rebound slide is at an angle. Then compressing the rebound slide spring and dropping the back of the slide down so the spring is retained by the stud. Use caution, this is a powerful spring. This is where that special tool really comes in handy. We can remove the cylinder now. The main spring is installed by engaging the top hooks of the spring into the stirrup and the bottom of the spring into the slot in the frame. The spring is retained by the strain screw. Fasten the screw snugly. Check that the bottom of the spring is centered on the frame and the top is properly engaged in the stirrup. The hammer block fits loosely over the stud on the rebound slide. Press the top of the hammer block back against the hammer. Now, take this opportunity to lubricate the studs and the wear points. To install the side plate, the slot on the back of the side plate must line up with the hammer block. Hold the slide plate at a bit of an angle and fit the top of the slide plate first. Then look to see that it fits over the hammer block properly. The side plate should fit with very little force. A few light taps of the plastic hammer should be all it takes to get a smooth fit. Install the flat headed plate screw. Then make sure you have the two crown headed screws correctly identified. Here I use a micrometer but you could just as easily keep them separate. Now, install the correct screw in the middle position. Add a few drops of oil to the yoke and install the yoke and cylinder assembly. Be cautious not to force the fit. The assembly should install easily. The front crown headed plate screw can now be installed. This will retain the yoke and cylinder. You should perform a function test to make sure the action moves smoothly and properly. The final step is to install the stocks. Remember to press them straight on while aligning the stud in the butt of the frame with the holes in the stocks. Now, Firmly install the stock screw. Be careful not to over tighten the stock screw. The escutcheon nut on the right hand stock is just pressed into the wood so you don't want to spin it loose. And that completes the assembly of the Smith & Wesson Model 10. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That's a very interesting pistol. Until next time, I'm Jim Humphrey with Imminent Threat Defense Firearms Training. Be safe out there, join the NRA, and enjoy your firearms.